what's your biggest hurdle you've had to overcome? And I think the biggest hurdle that not only that I've had to overcome, but most people do, is themselves, the stuff that they have going on in their heads. Good evening, Australia. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael Kozilny, and this is Tough Times Never Last, but tough people do. An amazing lady on the couch tonight, uh, Rosie Pika, one of the world's finest motivational speakers, and she's a former detective um, and is very good at dealing with crisis. She's shared her own uh, uh, fair share of tough times when she got so low one time that she said she um, she just didn't want to wake up anymore. But Rosie, it's amazing how you are. You're so authentic and, you know, you can uh, just be you. Thank you, Michael. Well, it's pretty hard to be somebody else. It's always much easier to be authentic uh, mm. than anything else. And it was the one thing, the biggest thing, because, you know, I've written, I brought along a couple of books for you, but I'm writing my eighth at the moment. And I discovered the biggest thing that people always ask me is, what's your biggest hurdle you've had to overcome? And I think the biggest hurdle that not only that I've had to overcome, but most people do, is themselves, the stuff that they have going on in their heads. And I, like a lot of other people that grew up with, you know, maybe migrant parents or, you know, those that weren't so well skilled in life lessons as we'd love everyone to be, you know, the perfect parents that don't exist. You know, I carried a lot of baggage from childhood into, you know, my teenage years. Well, tell me this, Rosie. Um, uh, I joined the police force in 86 and... Um, um yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. I've found a lot of people join the police force because of um, maybe baggage or insecurity mm -hmm. or some just want to make a difference. But um, when did you join the police force and, and what do you think you joined? Well, I joined in 1987 and it's actually a, quite an interesting story. At that time, I'm a miss, give everything a go, try everything in life and, you know, really live life fully. So I was working with special needs children and I'd worked with them for three years. I'd also been a barmaid. I'd been a bit of, you know, anything and everything, a gymnastics coach. And and I was in the habit of applying for jobs. And a job came up, it was 1987, for a, a police officer. And at the time, I was working at Cairnsfoot School in Arncliffe in Sydney. And I had a shonky teaching number. <laughs> so I wasn't a qualified teacher. This is back in the 80s. You could get away with stuff back then. And uh, when they offered me by telegram, most people listening today won't know what a telegram is, but it was well before Wi-Fi and the internet yeah, yeah, and everything yeah. else, I received a telegram offering me my position full time because I was a permanent casual and all permanent casuals were meant to want permanent positions. And I thought, oh, I can't offer and take up this job because if I do, they'll know my teaching number's shonky and they'll sack me anyway, so I won't have a job. So what am I going to do? There was the ad in the newspaper. I was in the habit of applying for ads I saw, so I applied. Six weeks later, I was in the police academy at Goulburn, wondering what the hell I was doing there in the middle of winter. It's actually 30 Rosie, how years long, ago. 30 years ago. How long in, in, in the police academy, how long in the police force, and uh, uh, when did you get out? Okay, well, 30 years ago yesterday was our celebration date. I saw someone post on Facebook, and we all still have the mug <laughs> to say <laughs> we were there, our token for that time. Uh, we were in the academy for three months and then we came out, we were probationary constables because you were Victoria, I was New South Wales. And from there, we then went back to the academy at Redfern because I was in the city of Sydney where I was stationed at uh, Rockville and Cogra. A very successful career and, and you achieved the rank of detective. Uh, no, what? senior constable. And I didn't do detectives. What I did was a lot of plain clothes uh, yes. as well as uniform. Okay. Um, why did you get out? Because I actually applied. I, I, my stress levels went very high at the time. You know, when we're young, we're dealing with experiences that, you know, you can't equip a person for. You can't equip a person to seeing a dead body laying in two at the side of a roadway. You can't equip a, a person with seeing a person's face smashed with a hammer that it's pulverized beyond recognition. You can't equip a young person with seeing a lifeless, you know, 18-month-old that you've got to sit beside in the morgue and poke them and hope that life might come 
come back into them. You're not equipped at the age of, you know, 20, 21 to talk with the parents, you know, that their child has been brutalised and raped, you know. it's There are too many things that as an overload, that as a caring person, you're not equipped well enough for. And no, you're so right, Rosie, and I'm just... Um, yeah, I, I completely agree that the mind is um, fascinating and, and very delicate and, uh, and and we really have to protect it, don't we? Exactly. And, and what was the lowest uh, point you reached? Was there a time when you thought, I just want to check out and have an early departure and, uh, and kill yourself? Well, yes, but what I did want to share is that it's not just from the police force. It's from, you know, people that are war veterans, nurses, you know, fire brigade. There's so many first responders and emergency services that go through a similar thing as we did dealing with situations that we're not equipped to deal with that turn to drink, turn to, uh, you know, maybe even drugs or turn to... Or even sex addictions. Yeah, all sorts of different ways to distract the mind from looking at or being preoccupied. And, you know, if you're carrying baggage from childhood, which I had been, I grew up in a domestic violence situation. Mm, Sorry to hear that. And again, well, I'm not now, you know, back then different i i was what was called well balanced i had a chip on either side (laughs) so you couldn't tell me anything rosie um what year was the lowest and and uh when you when not when you Mm. did sort of want to end it all was there a time yes there was that's why i remember on the witness box you're going to answer the question i brought it i brought it back to my teenage years because the first time was in my teenage years and then the second time was in within the police force so that was the reason why that i was bringing it back saying that it's not because of just these experiences and that's where most other people that experiences difficulty that go on in their heads it's not from that one experience that's tipped it off combination so you were going through um, all the stressors of the the police force, which um, the mind didn't catch up. You had you had relationship issues at the same time, and um, mm. and also sort of um, thoughts of the past you hadn't dealt with. So, what happened when the crisis hit? Well, at that time, I had attempted to take my own life. I had swallowed, you know, a whole heap of pills, and uh, at the hospital they took me to. The doctor said, you know, she's not suicidal, and I thought, <laughs> I don't know what you got to do to be suicidal. I would have thought, you know, this might have done it, but apparently not. So then I took my revolver and uh, I took it out with just one single bullet because I thought that's all I need. I don't want someone coming across it afterwards and being able to use it. And uh, fortunately, those at the station were sort of aware. Uh, I don't know whether my now ex-husband had had alerted them to my state of mind, which he probably had, um, and they came and fought me and tackled me and <laughs> got the weapon off me and, God bless and then you, put darling. me I'm into lockdown. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Rosie. So I'm grateful to them we'll for that. We'll just have that. a break, mm. but I'm glad you're here. Thank Sometimes you. Sometimes silence is all we need. You know, you you could have not been here, but it's beautiful. And, and you've, you know, you've made yourself the perfect person we are. We'll talk about how you got yourself back to the first class person you are, but uh, we'll be back very shortly with Rosie Peaker. Welcome back to the show. Michael Kazilny, Tough Times Never Last. If you're going through some difficult issues at the moment, just um, just go through them. Sometimes there's nothing to fix. Sometimes um, you just have to surround yourself with people. Don't keep isolated. A bit of meditation helps. Um, you might have gone through a divorce or separation, can't see the children. You might have an addiction. But uh, just remember that everything's impermanent. All the good things never last and all the bad things never last either. And, um, and, and, and it's always uh, difficult to remember that that every human being goes through difficult times. I've gone through so many difficult times. I really think life's a mixture of 50% joys and 50% sorrows. And and that's so true, Rosie. You said you hit rock bottom and and, and, and it doesn't, you know, we don't then just stay happy for the rest of our lives. There, there's other rock bottoms down the track. Oh, of course. And, you know, I, I don't use that word failure that other people like to use. They all, you know, talk about problems and difficulties in their lives and, and 
and use that word. I, I call it a state of being yes. and it's temporary and you can transition through it. The difference is, is whether you've been given the skills or you've sought the skills to help you get through it because you just don't go from being, you know, rock bottom and depressed or overwhelmed or in extreme grief to phenomenally happy and incredibly excited about life unless you're bipolar, <laughs> you know, and even then we utilize medication, we utilize whatever it is we need just to give us a foothold in a different direction, a direction away from what it is that's making us feel so lousy and miserable. Mm, Rosie, there's millions of people um, uh, around Australia, around the world suffering at the moment, um, you know, and they don't know how to cope. I mean, even relationship breakups when uh, marriage breakups are difficult and sometimes with that comes people having to move to a new home, which is mm. another stressor with that is... Um, um, well, the more personal it is, the more difficult it is for yeah. us because obviously if it's our neighbour who has lung cancer and is faced with a terminal you know, problem, that's like, oh, isn't that terrible? That's not good. It's when it's our own loved of one course. that has it, that it or ourselves that all of a sudden it becomes all-consuming. Mm. So it's understanding that problems are personal and how big a problem is is by how much attention we give to it in our life. And I, I you know, I talk on this every week and every week I say almost the same message that if it doesn't feel good, you've got to either face it or replace it. And face it means how can you play with those thoughts to loosen them up so they don't have a stranglehold on your life? Because, you know, my programs are all about kicking butt and butt is about bloody useless thoughts because we fill our heads with it. And you're never more dead in your life than when you've got all those bloody useless thoughts. And they say an average model is thinking 60,000 thoughts per day. So an that's average a lot of, An average model, an average human being. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm putting us in the average status for now. Right. But, uh, you know, some of us, we're, you know, thinking 80,000 thoughts a day, you know. And if that's crap and that's crud and that's I'm not good enough, I'll never get over this, this is lousy, This is I can't face it. If that's the thought compounded again and again and again and then all of a sudden we want to feel happy, it just doesn't work. It doesn't connect. It doesn't. It so, doesn't what about all these um, really good-looking actors and they've got, they get paid $17 million per movie and everyone loves them, they, they know they're good looking and they think they're super human and then they they get depressed and suicide but anyone can be hollow on the inside it's nothing to do with what they see on the outside and that's the inconsistency that you mentioned right at the start about being authentic now when we're authentic it means that it doesn't matter whether I wear a police uniform or not it doesn't matter whether I'm a motivational speaker or not because we know lots of speakers out there who will talk on stage aren't I wonderful aren't I amazing look at what I've done look at the pictures of where I've been who I've mm. been with this isn't this amazing I go home and I kick the cat out of the way and I'm screaming at the kids and I'm so yelling. So you were so authentic you could sit there That's in your pyjamas. Exactly. Could you sit there naked? You want me back next? No. <laughs> Why want, not? Because, How authentic are you? Because that's You're my a... special space. Oh. You ain't getting to my special space, buddy. How long have we known each other? <laughs> no. But that's where my authenticity is the fact that it doesn't add to me and it doesn't take away from me Certainly. anything that I have. And that was what my lesson was in learning to overcome those thoughts that I wasn't good enough or that I didn't have enough value unless I was seen to be achieving, unless I was seen to be doing good in the community or having things that were worthwhile that made my life of value. Now, there are lots of people that grow up with people around them that have got their own hurt. And I use a saying, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. So my parents were hurt people. They were people from a generation of war, to, you know, the Second World War. But the Ukrainians, they must migrants. have been beautiful people, kind-hearted Cossacks, Orenishka yeah. and Borscht. If you have sort of a Russian parent as my father was, you know. They, they, they drink a bit, don't they? No, he didn't drink. Didn't he, he just had, a, you know, his father was a, an immigrant from the First World War and, you know, he'd been a wounded soldier in that and he had a lot of anger and violence and that was what he was brought up with. So that's all he knew to repeat. Now, he changed that later in life and that's what I talk about, you know, there's no age and no stage that says we can't change. No. It's up to us individually. And he changed later in life and became <coughs> gentle and caring. But before that, 
he was quite violent, quite aggressive, and that's what I grew up in. So I was a fighter from a very young age. So Rosie, you took the, you took that fighting to the stage. Tell me about what you do overseas because you tell me about. Well, the, what uh, I love you, is is helping. Is still love helping people, yeah. but I love helping people by raising their awareness yeah. that they're much more than they ever thought they were before. And mm-hmm. this is what I learned for myself. And I learned for myself first how to be at peace and accept exactly where I was at, exactly who I was with, exactly mm-hmm. whatever my environment was. And from that, what skills could I use without anything outside of myself? What did I have access to? What I had access to was up here. Mm-hmm. What are my thoughts? What am I thinking on a daily basis? What are my habits? But what about repeating? the viewers? They're saying, Rosie's great, she's doing this, but we need some help. We're going to suicide. Okay, well, the I'm, first thing, I'm suffering myself. What do we do? Okay, well, what first do we thing do, is go to heroesforheroes.com, spelt yep. without an E. All right. So heroesforheroes.com. Download. There's brain entrainment there that is a free product that I've put on there, f- available for everyone to access immediately. Now, it was created by an engineer in Canada. He's the only brain entrainment expert in the world. Yeah. And he created it because he suffered from depression himself. And he didn't suffer from depression because of difficult things. He just had it. He couldn't put his finger on amazing? what a cause was to yeah. be able to work through the cause. So <coughs> he created this product. It's since been used by the Brazilian government, tried on all the Brazilian soldiers with a phenomenal and it changes success the frequency right. of your mind. It does. It's not like there's, you know, binaural beats. It's different to that. But it, through its use, it's phenomenal. If I use it tonight, we'll have a good sleep? That'll be the first positive side effect. How long does it take? Good How long sleep. It... it goes for about 24 minutes. And Fantastic. It's... I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> See you in bed. <laughs> we'll be back very shortly. Thank you very much for the pleasure of your company and um, uh, and all those lovely emails over the years. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people suffering, isn't there? That's why I thought it was such a great idea to continue the show on over the last few years. Some beautiful people on the couch. And I think it's really important to, to show a bit of loving kindness to others and not judge people, you know, just to be authentic like Rosie says and uh, just smile a bit more. No one's smiling anymore. I walk around and, you know, everyone's got their own little issues going on. But, you know, this week let's all try to smile, show a bit of loving kindness because at the end of the day, what's it all about when we die? Who have we loved and who has loved us? That's that's what love is so important, isn't it? If we can become totally... Oh, well, and tr- I just got off the flight from Virgin and they ended the flight by saying, you know, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And that I thought, what so... a good reminder to all the people travelling. I like Thank you, um, former senior constable, Peter. <laughs> you know, I, I, I spent 10 years in the police force and I was very good at dealing with crisis, but, um, you know, I do go into the self-pity party sometimes and, you know, what about me? But I love this book, Time to Kick Butt, No Self-Pity Parties. Um, you're good at dealing with crisis, uh, Rosemary Peter. Well, I think you've got to be a master of your own pity pot and all of us sit in our own pity pot at different times. The mm. difference is between those of us who acknowledge <laughs> we're in our pity pot and those that don't. And, you know, you and I put our hands up and we go, yep, been there, been there regular, you know, got my frequent fly miles on it. Uh, and that's the beauty of, you know, they say successful people, you know, they look, oh, you wouldn't know about failure. Well, we know about failure the most <laughs> because it's only in having face first into it again and again and again that you know your own strength in being able to get back up and to be able to, you know, do that little bit more than you did before. And sometimes some people will say to me, but Rose, I just don't have it in me. I don't have a desire. I don't have an interest. That's when you need a pattern interrupt. That's when that brain entrainment is all important because you don't do the work. You plug in, you simply listen. And if you can't listen, then you're really at zero level of being able to input. Rosie, Secrets of Inspiring Women Exposed. I mean, uh, th- this is quite an amazing book. Um, uh, you know, it's got some of the most inspirational women uh, around Australia too. 
confidence is very important. I, I really think sometimes that 85% of um, uh, society is shuffling around and is suffering from low conf- confidence. How did you build up your, if I can call it, mm. supreme confidence? Mm. Mm. Low self-esteem, I think, is an age-old problem throughout history, and it's endemic of all our wars, all our ish, everything to do with low self-esteem. I think it should be taught from a really young age, uh, the, that opportunity to be kind, to be caring, to dare to, you know, smile that bit more. I did it, you know, not that long ago through Boston and New York. I was the only one grinning and people were like moving further away from me. I think they thought, what's she up to? What's she on? She's smiling so much. This is not normal. And that word normal, I think, is quite dangerous because we start measuring ourselves against another person. And that's where we think we don't quite come up to par because we're only looking at the outsides. We're looking at the facade. We're looking at the dream someone else is trying to sell us. It may not be our dream. So part of that authenticity is knowing what is it that's important about me. For me, what's important is, you know, I've got a young child. He's nine years of age. He gets up and he smiles and he hugs me and he says, I love you, mum. That to me is my value right there. Other people will say, but Rosie, I don't have children. I don't have someone. Okay, there's so many people, seven billion people on this planet. You know, you don't have to be the most important person on the planet. And, you know, to the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you can be that world. So you're saying, Rosie, um, to build up that super confidence, uh, own yourself and, and appreciate the things in your life. Well, first off, love and appreciate yourself. Yeah. Start to look at all that you've been through. You're still here. Yeah. The fact that you're still here is pretty doggone amazing. When you start thinking of the challenges and the difficulties and the hurdles and everything you've had to face to get to this point right now, that is what is amazing of so many individuals that I get to meet and I'm quite sure that you get to meet as well as taking it and owning it for ourselves. Going and then, Rosie, we, so we've built up this um, this confidence, this successful career, and, um, you know, we think everything's great. We're driving the nice car. And and it seems like the higher you get, the, the, the attacks come on. Look, look at that uh, idiot. Uh, look at Rosie. I can't believe the, uh, the bullshit she said on stage. Then we get the backstabbers. Uh, how do we but handle those? Where, well, I don't give them any attention. Why should I? I'd have to value their opinion for their opinion to matter to me. Yeah, right. And so I don't give that value there. I'm the one who knows me. I'm the one who knows what I do on a daily basis. I'm the only one who has an opinion that matters in my life. Shall we confront the bully and uh, and push him back and say, piss off? No. Because there's a lot of bullies that starts right mm. from school, goes in the workplace and, um, it's you know, it, in I friendship circles. What I, I, you know, I've done some presentations where they've warned me, given a heads up right at the start, Rosie, we've got some old school dinosaurs that really don't like your <laughs> rosy attitude to start with and they'll let me know that and they they've said if you swear like say bloody <laughs> for bloody use of sorts they're going to shut it down so i address it right at the start and i talk about the type of people that want to limit you that want to keep you constrained and conformed into a certain way of being so that they can be comfortable and because i address it early they can't stand up and shut me down because then they're showing to everyone where that person she's just mm. talking about in having <coughs> been identified they were forced to sit there and I watched them fold their arms like don't yeah, like yeah. this woman in the you slightest the you know who's paying her and how much Jeez. are we paying her uh, and as I continued I then shared ways that we come together collectively I share ways of how you know one one kind word one nice thing something that's shared that uplifts people remember other people because of how we made them feel make them feel good and all of a sudden we start to come together we start to align and at the end, these people actually stood up and publicly apologised to the whole group uh, mm. for how they were. So they weren't. Con- if I confronted them as the bullies they were, they would have shut down and just hated me. Yeah. Instead, if you address the behaviour instead of attacking the person, you can change the behaviour. Rosie, um, a lot of people are going through difficult times, and there's mm. now millions of people. It builds up so much they get into a manic state and have breakdowns and then end up in psychiatric institutions. I'm just uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I've been dealing with it all my life on the police force and through the courts but I had a personal experience um, recently and um, it's amazing the amount of people who can ha- have a breakdown. And with the you know involvement of drugs and other factors that yeah. you know challenge 
the mental state. You know, that's not my field of expertise. We've got to look after our minds, though, don't we, exactly. darling? Exactly. And stay positive. Get rid of those bloody useless thoughts first off. It's a, it's an inside job, you know. It's an inside. Rosie, thank you very much. You're a thank beautiful you. human being <laughs> dedicated to making the world a better place. I think that's where we're going to put in your gravestone. One of the most beautiful people who dedicated her life to making the, uh, the world a more beautiful place. And she didn't die wandering. No, but I'll, <laughs> but we'll have you on again. You've got such beautiful uh, inspiration. It. It's a short interview, folks, but what a beautiful lady. She really is a beautiful soul, um, you know, helping as many people as she can. And um, she's um, yeah, made herself close to perfect. Love and best wishes. We'll see you uh, next week. And good night. Good night.